Professor Christensen is one of the most thoughtful and interesting uh, and engaged people that I've had a chance to work with at my time of Google. And I'm really, really excited to uh, allow uh, all of us to, to share a little bit of that today. So without further ado, Professor Clayton Christensen. You're very kind, Matt. And I'm just uh, delighted that you guys would be it worth your while to come here and talk about some of the things that I want to propose. Um, what I, there are kind of three main objectives in my talk. The first one is, my gosh, uh, Google is in a wonderful spot. And almost never in the history of mankind has anybody be seem to be so successful in much the, uh, that you're trying to do. And the reason why I worry about that is that success is very hard to sustain. And if you look across the sweep of business history, almost every company which at one point were widely regarded as unassailably successful, a, a, a 10 or 20 years later, you find them in the middle of the pack or the bottom of the heap. And uh, I'll get into the, a little bit about that later, but the, the scary thing about this is that it's actually good management that causes successful companies to stumble. And so the solutions that you might think about are not solutions at all. So anyway, that's one reason why I came is to just share the despair that <laughs> comes with success. And then um, the second one is that growth is actually a huge issue everywhere. Um, not just American companies, but <coughs> Japanese and, and European companies are even more desperate for growth. In China, which has been on a roll for over the last 10 years, find themselves not able to grow there. And uh, politicians are worried that we can't grow, and they have no idea where growth comes from uh, at the level of uh, national economies. And if our nations are not prosperous, then companies find it hard to be prosperous. So that's what I want to talk about, uh, if that's all right. And what I'd like to offer to you, in, which is my, the third objective today, is that I want to talk to you about theories about management. And the word theories gets a, rum, a bum rap with managers because the word theory is associated with the word theoretical, which connotes impractical. But a theory is a statement of causality. It's a statement of what causes what and why. And when you think about it in those terms, you as technologists or managers are voracious consumers of theory. Because every time you take an action, it's predicated upon a belief that if you do this, you'll get the result that you want. And every time you put a plan into place, it's predicated upon a set of theories, which tells you if you do these things, you'll be successful. But most of the people aren't even aware of the theories that they use. And many times, the theories that you use are um, destructive rather than productive. Um, so this is that's why I have spent much of my academic life trying to understand theories about management. So there's not one grand theory of management that solves all problems of managers, but there really are uh, theories about different dimensions of a manager's job, um, which are quite helpful. And you'll see with some of those as I'll present them today. And it is as if, if you came to my office, um, there would be a shelf there. And on that shelf will be a set of uh, theories about management. And some of them do, are, have emerged from my own research. And next to them are theories about management that other members of our faculty have offered. 
And there are a few slots on the shelf that aren't filled because there are really important theories about management for which nobody has provided a theory yet. So for example, metrics and how you measure things is a huge deal. And yet there isn't a, a theory about metrics. So, but with these as a set of building blocks, if somebody can then come to us with a problem, rather than giving them my opinion about how to solve the problem, instead, what we're able to do is say, well, if that's the problem, you know, then we have a theory on the shelf called the theory of disruption. And I bet you that if we put that theory on like a set of lenses and examine this problem, we might be able to understand what's going on. And so that's what I want to do is, is explain to you a set of problems for which good theories might help you. And I picked these ones because I think uh, you probably are facing similar problems. So, um, if you think about our economy much, you'd realize that occasionally we have a recession. And when our economy goes into a recession, we'll hit bottom at some point. And then there, it takes some time before companies have to start hiring people again. Um, because the people who are on board can satisfy the demand uh, of, the, of getting more orders for a while. And uh, we have had nine recessions since World War II. And in the first six of those nine recessions, on average, it took our economy six months from, from the point when they hit bottom to get to the point where they needed to hire more workers. But um, we had a recession in 1991-92 where it took our economy 15 months to get to the point where they needed to hire people again. Then we had a recession in 2001-02 um, so it took us 15 months in that recession to get to the point where they had to hire people. Then we had a recession in 0102, where it took our economy 39 months in aggregate to get to the point where they're hiring more people. Then the most recent recession, it took us our economy nearly six years to get to the point where we needed to hire more people. And what seems to be happening incre increasingly is these rebounds appear to be financial, not real in character. So the people who have money get a lot of money a lot faster. But the rest of us, they don't, they're not jobs into which we can be slotted in anymore. And there's something fundamentally has gone wrong with our economy. And what we see in the economy is a summary of what's going on in most companies as well. So I want to propose that there are four different types of innovations. And the reason why I'd like to focus on innovation is because whenever a company makes an investment, they invest in an innovation of one sort or another. And so what I want to do is describe these four types of innovations and then teach a little bit more about whether and why and where they will create growth. There are potential products, meaning nobody's figured out what these are yet. Then the second one are sustaining innovations that make those products better. The third are disruptive products that grow markets. And then the fourth are efficiency innovations in which they sell them off in order to get their money back. So let me start with potential innovations. Um, almost any study about innovation will say that if you, of all of the people, of all of the products whose product development are initiated in a company, only about 15 to 25 percent of them will become financially successful. And it's broadly viewed that um, innovation is a crapshoot. 
the more pri projects you la launch, the more success you'll be. But in, in its end, it's a crapshoot. And what we've concluded is that's not true. Uh, the reason why it appears that we can't predict in advance whether a customer will buy the products that we're developing is that people at business schools like Harvard uh, teach mar marketing in a perverse way. And in particular, we've decided that understanding the customer is the wrong unit of analysis. So to illustrate that, just look at me for a second, if you wouldn't mind. My name is Clayton Christensen. I am 64 years old, unfortunately. I used to be six, 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 six feet eight inches, unfortunately. And I now am six feet six inches, unfortunately. And uh, I married a wonderful wife, fortunately. We have five kids. The third of them, Michael, unfortunately came here to Stanford. And I have all kinds of other characteristics and attributes, as you can see. But none of my characteristics or attributes have not yet caused me to buy the New York Times today. There might be a correlation between the propensity that I will buy the New York Times but my characteristics don't cause me to buy it, nor do our characteristics and attributes cause us to, do, to buy any product or service. And yet almost all of the work that we do in assessing market potential, we look at the characteristics or attributes of the potential customers. And a better way to think of it, we decided, is that, um, darn it, Every day, stuff happens to us. Jobs arise in our life. And when we, these jobs arise, we need to find some way to get the jobs done. And some of the jobs are simple, incremental things that happen regularly. Others are dramatic and important breakthrough problems. But whenever we have a job to do, we have to find something and pull it into our lives in order to get the job done. And what we've decided is understanding the job is the critical key to develop products that we can predictably make and find the customers to buy. So to, illustration, to illustrate this point, um, a number of years ago, as this idea of the job to be done was emerging from our research, McDonald's was trying to decide how they could improve the sales of their milkshakes. And as some of you might know, McDonald's is a very sophisticated marketing company. And they have data out the gazoo about every dimension of, their, of what they're doing. And so when you go in on the, the, uh, the menu, Behind that, there is a profile, a, a demographic profile, of the quintessential customer that likes to buy that product when they come. And so what they've done is they have these cohorts of people who are the quintessential milkshake customers, for example. And it turns out that I fit that profile perfectly. <laughs> so they would take people like me into conference rooms and ask, you know, can you just help us how we can improve the milkshake so you'll buy more of them? The customers would provide very clear guidance about how to improve it. They would then improve the product on those dimensions, and it had no impact or sales whatsoever on the product. So what we decided is that that's not the right way to frame it, but rather there's got to be a job out there somewhere that people find themselves needing to get done for which they go to McDonald's to hire a milkshake. And we need to understand what the job is. So one of our colleagues uh, stood in a restaurant one day for 18 hours and just took very careful notes on um, what time did they buy these milkshakes 
What was he wearing? Was he alone or with other people? Did he buy anything else or just the milkshake? Did they eat it in the restaurant or get in the car and go off with it? And it turned out that about 50% of the customers bought the milkshake before 8.30 in the morning. It was the only thing they bought. They were always alone. And they always got in the car and, and drove off with it. So um, we decided we need to understand what was this job, you know? So we came back the next day and we positioned ourselves outside the, the restaurant so that we could confront these people as they were emerging with their milkshake. <laughs> and in language that they could understand, we'd ask them, I got a problem with your behavior here. <laughs> what job were you trying to do that caused you to come here to hire this milkshake? And as they would struggle to answer, we'd, ask, we'd try to help them by asking, well, look, think about the last time you were in the same situation, needing to get the same job done, but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake. What did you hire to do the job? And it turned out that they all had the same job to do. And that is they had a long and boring drive to work. And gosh, one hand had to be on the wheel, but somebody gave me another hand and there isn't anything in it to drive with. <laughs> and I just need to do something with my, you know, while I'm driving. And I, I'm not hungry yet, but I know that I'll be hungry by 10 o'clock, so I also need something that will just go thunk and stay there till 10 o'clock. So what, what, when I have this problem to do, what else do I hire? And one guy said, you know, I never thought of it in these terms, but last Friday I hired a banana to do the job. <laughs> Take my word for it, never hire bananas. <laughs> They're gone in less than a minute. I'm hungry by 7.30. Another guy said, you promise not to tell my wife, please. But I, don't, I hire donuts a lot to get this job done. <laughs> but they actually don't do the job well. You know, I promised my wife that I'm going to lose money, but I, I add it. And they cream, they cream crumbs all over my clothes and my fingers get gooey and I put that on the wheel. And another guy said, yeah, I do bagels sometimes, but geez, the bagels are so dry and tasteless. I have to steer the car with my knees while I put the cream cheese on. <laughs> and then if the phone rings, I got three problems in th two hands. And, you know, one guy said I hired a Snickers bar to do the job, but I felt so guilty I've never hired Snickers again. <laughs> but let me tell you, whenever I have this job and I come here to hire McDonald's, uh, McDonald's milkshakes, it is so viscous, it takes me 23 minutes to suck it up that thin little straw. <laughs> Who knows what the ingredients are? I don't care. All I know <laughs> is it's in my stomach all morning, and it fits right in my cup holder. And it turns out that the, the, the milkshake does the job better than any of the competitors. And the competitors are not Burger King milkshakes, but it's bananas and donuts and bagels and Snickers bars and coffee and a few other things. And then it turned out that in the afternoon, it was hired for a very different job. And that is somebody is a parent, just have, needs to have a sweet, uh, uncluttered time to talk about whatever is on the, the mind of their child. And they hire the milkshake to do this job. And it does that job very well. But it's a very different job than what the morning job is. And it turns out that this is not unusual. That almost always, Peter Drucker said, that the customer rarely buys what the company thinks it's selling them. And that's why I, want, I said at the beginning that understanding the job is what's critical in developing successful products. The customer is the wrong unit of analysis because the customer finds herself in different, needing to have different jobs to be done over the course of a day or a week or a month. Um, so there's a job out there somewhere near here that needs to get done. And people find themselves needing to get this job's job done in different frequencies. 
And that is, I need to get this from here to there as fast as possible with perfect certainty. How many of you have found that you needed to get this job done in the last year? Almost everybody. Uh, it turns out that Julius Caesar had this job to do. But when uh, he had the job, he could hire a horseman and a chariot to get the job done. Queen Victoria had the very same job to do, but she could hire the telegraph and a railroad to get the job done. And Julius or, uh, Winston Churchill could hire an air, airplane to get it done. And now our leaders can hire DHL. But the job itself has been fundamentally unchanged over these centuries. And that's a characteristic of most jobs, that they are very stable over time. But the technology that we could hire to get the job done changes in, in, uh, at a scaring rate in some times. And so if we think of the business that we're in as I'm in the business of DHL and I compete against um, F F FedEx, uh, my, my life is very um, unpredictable. But if I think of the job to be done as the core business, then life is very stable. And it, it makes it a lot easier for us to predict what will be the next technology. Let me just describe, I'm sorry, I, I need to tell you a couple things about myself. I'm st st stumbling around because I, I've had a couple of rounds of chemotherapy for cancers that I've had, and one of the, the side effects is that I can't feel my feet. So, um, and then, so that I, while I'm looking at you, I don't know if my feet are over there or here. <laughs> And then I had a stroke. Um, a clot came from somewhere and lodged itself right there in my brain. And it formulated the portion of my speech where I, the place where we formulate. It killed the portion of my brain where you formulate speech. This happened about four years ago. And just like that, I lost my ability to speak. And I've been trying to learn how to speak again. Uh, and there's a program called Rosetta Stone for English. <laughs> Turns out it was very good. <laughs> um, but you see in my language, um, sometimes I'm struggling to come up with the word, and that's because I, I lost it. And I'm learning how to speak from the other side of my brain. And I notice that I notice that I'm uh, speaking to the floor a lot. And the reason why is if I look at the floor, I can focus on what the next sentence has to be. And if I look at you, you dist distract me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that I have become shy all of a sudden, but I just kind of, so I apologize for that. Anyway, um, there is an architecture to every job to be done. So the fundamental, the foundation, is there's a job that I need to know, given the situation that I'm in. And that's an important reason why understanding the customer is the wrong unit of analysis, because the, con the situation that I'm in has a huge impact on the nature of the job. And every job has a functional, an emotional, and a social dimension to the job. And the mix of those four, three depends upon the application or the situation they're in. If we understand what the job is, then we can ask the next question. So what are the experiences in purchase and use that we need to provide in order to get the, the, do the job perfectly? And if we understand what those experiences are, then we know what to integrate and how to integrate it so that we can provide the experiences needed to get the job done. And if we understand that, then it tells us what kind of brand we need to apply to that product so that when they find themselves needing to get the job done, um, that brand pops into their head. So 
to summarize why it's important to, to get these four levels of a brand or, or a business, I'm sorry, for the reason why we need to un understand the opportunity in terms of the job rather than the customer. We need to understand the what the job the customer needs to do. We need to understand what, how customers will choose us. And we also need to then be able to say what we can do that other people can't, which is how we integrate. And finally, how will everyone knows what product does the job best? Um, there's a job that arises in people's lives that happened to our son Mike when he came out here to start at Stanford. And after a couple days out here, he called Christine and me back. And he said, Mom and Dad, I found our apartment and I need to furnish my apartment tomorrow. And so there's a job that Mike needed to be done. That is, I need to furnish my apartment tomorrow. Um, when you find that you have that need, that job to be done, is there a brand that pops into your mind that says, this is what I can do to get this job done perfectly? Ikea. Ikea. How many of you used the, said the word Ikea in your mind when I told you what the job was? Look around. Isn't that interesting? That when, and, and that's what we mean by a purpose brand. We need to organize our product around a job that does it so, purposeless, so perfectly that anybody around the world who find themselves needing to get that job done, they think of IKEA. And the, IKEA has no competitors. There are other retailers that sell furniture, but there is nobody in the world that is organized around that job to be done. As a result, they are wildly profitable. Um, and you think about this for a minute. Their owner is the third richest guy in the world. The quality of the, furn the f furniture that they buy is marginal. <coughs> and they sell it to the low end of humanity, <laughs> uh, college graduates. <laughs> And clearly, they are able to price a premium, get a premium. Their customers are delighted to pay a premium price for their products. And the reason why that is, is that if you, if you hire a product to get a job done, and it doesn't do the job well, then you have to take it back or throw it away or give it or re repair it and go out and find something that will do the job done well. And if that doesn't do well, then you have to test it and talk to your friends. And when you find yourselves buy buying a product and find that it doesn't do the job well, it is very costly to find something that does it well. And that's a reason why it can be so profitable if you organize around a job to be done because the customers will deli be delighted to pay a premium price for your product because the alternative of a, something that is, doesn't do the job well is very costly. Now, so that's the first type of innovation, and we call them potential products because they're, they're, we don't know their potential unless we understand the job to be done. The second type of innovation we call sustaining products that make good products better. And so the day after we launch into a, a new product where you've figured out there's a job to be done, we have a product to, to do the job well immediately we, we start improving those products. And we call those products sustaining innovations. And they're important. When we look around the world as we walk around, almost all of the innovations that we see are sustaining products. Um, they help companies keep their margins healthy. 
they are the mechanism for gaining market share. And those of you who are working on Ad, AdWords and other of your products are engaged in sustaining innovations. They're critical. But because they replace older products with new ones, they don't create growth. So imagine that I'm working for Toyota and I convince you to buy the Prius, the hybrid car, then you won't be buy a, a Camry. Um, if I sell you this year's best product, you won't buy last year's best product. And so by their very nature, sustaining innovations, although they are important, are replacative in character. And most of what we think about as innovation are of this sort. So that's the second type of innovations. The third type of innovation we call disruption. And they create growth. So let me describe, and this is going to be a complicated slide before we're done, so I apologize in advance. But you'll see these three concentric circles. And what they're made to represent is actually you can describe the history of any company in terms of these three uh, circles. The innermost circle represents the customers who have the most money and the best access to a product or service. And then as you go to the larger circles, they represent larger populations of people who have progressively less money. Almost always, industries begin in the center because the first products and services are so costly and complicated that only people who have a lot of that are able to buy it and use it. So given that, I want to then describe what disruption is and why it creates growth. So I'll put on the vertical axis the performance of product or, or services over time. In every market, there are two trajectories. The first one is, in every market, there's a trajectory of improvement that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing that, I'm sorry, in every market, there is a trajectory of improvement that customers are able to utilize in their lives. And uh, we don't think about this very much, but our lives don't change a lot. And that's why this is, to is, is so uh, flat. Then in every market, there's a different trajectory of improvement that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing better and better products. The most important finding about this is this trajectory of technological progress almost always outstrips the ability of customers to use the product. And what it means is that a technology at the beginning that isn't very good actually is prone to overshoot what those same customers are able to utilize at a later point in time. And there's not much gray hair in the room. But if you talk to somebody who was in their teens or 20s in the 1980s, we were at that time trying to figure out how to use word, uh, pro, uh, um, how we were learn, learning how to type on those early personal computers. About every 30 seconds, you had to stop and let the Intel 286 chip catch up to you. Because the world's fastest microprocessor could not even keep pace with our fingers on the left-hand side. But if you take your computer apart now and just look at the microprocessor there, we utilize only about 15% of the capability of that processor. Intel has just way overshot what most customers in mainstream applications are able to use. Now, some of the innovations that help good products better are incremental innovations. Others are dramatic breakthrough innovations. But we use a word for them that we call sustaining innovations, which was on the last slide, um, because they're really important. Almost always, incumbent companies who are the leaders on the left-hand side of the diagram find themselves still on top of the industry when these battles of sustaining innovations are over. And if you want to start a new business, 
and you want it to be successful, and you think you can beat the incumbents by making better products that you could sell for better profits to the customer's best competitors, um, they will kill you. <laughs> and the, the, the evidence is really very strong. It doesn't matter how big or powerful you are. Um, if you think that you can beat the incumbents in their market, um, they, will be, they will kill you. We could spend a lot of time on that. But there's another type of innovation that we call disruptive innovations. And disruptive innovations transform products which in the middle were too complicated and expensive. Now disruption makes it so much more affordable and accessible that many more people are able to use those products or services. And almost always, entrant companies typically win at disruption. And that's exactly what Google did, right? Because uh, ad ad advertisement and finding customers and making things known, you had to have a lot of money to play in that game. And then your technologies and services made it so that anybody could find what they needed, whether you're a buyer or a seller. And, and you change the world by making it affordable and accessible. And none of the incumbents who you guys beat um, are around today because entrants typically win. And let me describe why. So living in Boston as we have for the last three decades, um, there was in the 1970s and 80s a company there called Digital Equipment Corporation. And at that time, digital was widely be viewed as Google is now. They, it was the most widely admired company in all the world. And when you read explanations about why they were so successful, always success was attributed to the brilliance of their management team. And then about 1988, digital equipment just fell off the cliff and began to unravel very quickly when you then read explanations about why they had stumbled so badly, always it was attributed to the ineptitude of the management team. <laughs> and the very same people were running the, the, the company. And for a while, I framed the problem as, gosh, I wonder how smart people could get so stupid so fast. <laughs> and that's really the, the explanation that most people uh, jurn up when a company stumbles, that somehow a company that the management team that had its act together at one point were out of their league at a another time. But the re reason why the stupid manager hypothesis just didn't feel right is that every company that made the same class of computers, we called them mini computers, they were about the size of this pla uh, p pulpit, um, every company that made that dis, uh, were, were killed in unison. It wasn't just digital equipment, but it was Data General, Prime, Wang, Nixdorf, Hewlett Packard, Honeywell. And you'd expect these people to collude on pricing occasionally, but to collude to collapse was a stretch. <laughs> and trying to understand why they do that was the puzzle that we had. So as we understood it a little bit better, we realized that you know, this mini computer was quite a complicated product. It had to be sold direct to the customer. And the selling process involved a lot of training and support, supporting, support and service and software. And you had to have a cost like that in the business to play in the game. And that meant that digital equipment had to generate gross margins of 45% on computers that sold for 250,000 bucks. And that's how they made their money. Now, in their company, as in every company, uh, there were people coming in through the 1980s all the time with ideas for new products that they could develop. Some of these entailed making better products than, than, than th th they had ever made before. In fact, these mini computers would be so good that they could reach up into the tiers of the market where people historically had to buy mainframe computers. 
you looked at those business models, they could generate gross margins of 60%, and you could sell the products for twice as much money. So while the management was trying to decide if that's what they should do, there were other people coming in saying, ladies and gentlemen, you don't get it. Just look out the wall, out the window. Everybody is buying personal computers, which was the case in the 1970s and 80s. But when management would look out, in fact, they could see that everybody was buying mini com or mainframe computer. They could see that everybody was making personal computers. But there are a couple of other things that bothered them a lot. The first one, do you remember how crummy those early personal computers were? Apple app sold the Apple II as a toy to children. Not a single one of digital's customers could even use a personal computer for the first 10 years that they were in the management. And then when they, and they got no signal from their customers that the personal computer mattered because in fact it didn't to them. And then when you looked at the business, uh, the, the business details, it looked a lot worse because these small computers only generated gross margins of 40% and they were headed to 20% quickly and you could only earn those paltry percentages on computers that sold for 2,000 bucks. And so the question that the management had to address was, gosh, guys, let's sit down here. I wonder if we should make better products that we could sell for better profits to our best customers. Alternatively, maybe we should make worse products that none of our customers would buy that would ruin our margins. <laughs> what should we do? And it is a very, very hard problem, and we call it the innovator's dilemma. Because doing the right thing is the wrong thing, and doing the wrong thing is the right thing. Can you think about where else you've seen this happen, where somebody comes in with a simple product, going after customers who historically couldn't have access to it, and then it just grew up and killed the leaders? Blackberry. Yeah, they just knocked off um, sitting down with a laptop. And then Apple disrupted BlackBerry. And now um, Samsung and Huawei are in the process of disrupting Apple. It's a good one. Where else have you seen it? Disk drives. Disk drives. The big ones get disrupted by the little ones. And then the, smart, the uh, flash disrupted disk drives. And almost all of them are out of business now. That's a good example. Um, you guys look like you get, you are, uh, you ma make a lot of money. <laughs> and I saw Lexuses outside left and right in the parking lot. But that's not how Toyota entered America with Lexuses. Toyota came in with a rusty little subcompact in the 1960s called the Corona. And uh, it was so much more affordable and accessible that the rebar of humanity, people we call college students, <laughs> could own a car. And uh, generals, and so they came out here by making it affordable. And in the back plane, uh, General Motors and Ford were making big cars for big people. And people would see Toyota coming in, and Toyota went from a Corona to a Tercel, Corolla, Camry, Avalon, Forerunner, Sequoia, and then the Lexus. And as Toyota would come, were coming up there, going after new customers, um, they'd say, you know, we ought to go get those buggers. And so they'd design a Pinto or a Chevette and try to sell uh, subcompacts into the marketplace. But then their finance people would look at the money that they could make in subcompacts with the profitability that they could make making bigger SUP, SUVs and bigger pickup trucks to even bigger people. It absolutely made no sense to defend the low end of the business when they had the opportunity to make good products better. Uh, who's killing Toyota? They don't feel like they're getting killed, incidentally. Yeah, the Koreans. 
are just killing them at the low end. And, uh, and Toyota's doing the right thing, because why would they ever try to defend the low end of their business when they have the privilege of competing against Mercedes at the high end? And then the Chinese manufacturers are coming next. And we seriously don't need to worry about them. <laughs> and one of the reasons why this is so hard is that what is coming out in this dimension, in the third dimension, is that it competes against non-consumption. Um, because the products are so costly and expensive that behind them, there are no customers. They are potential customers, but if you make it affordable and accessible. And so looking at their world, it looks as if they're doing just fine. And it's, it's why almost always you have to have a new company with new people who are looking in the other direction because you're competing against non-consumption by making it affordable and accessible. And that's why growth comes in this dimension. And what almost always we find... <laughs> so I guess, um, you know, do you have uh, examples of companies that have successfully taken advantage of the, this, this notion of disruption where they themselves yeah, yeah. within their own company that disruption to take place? Yeah, it's a great question. It turns out that there really are a few who have done that, where they were the leaders um, and then they became the leader in the new wave without getting killed in the old one. Um, but only a few. And in, in every case, they succeeded by setting up a completely independent business unit and gave it a different, able to create a different profit formula and develop different processes. So as a, a good example, um, IBM uh, just dominated the mainframe business, but there were eight companies that made mainframe computers. The other seven all got killed when the mini computer came in underneath. But IBM succeeded by setting up, they made their mainframes in Poughkeepsie, New York, and they made their mini computers in uh, Rochester, um, Minnesota. And there were nine companies that made mini computers. Only one of them, IBM, succeeded. And they did it by setting up a different business unit in Florida and allowed them, made them figure out how to make products at 25% gross margins instead of 40% or 60%. Um, he, uh, Hewlett Packard did it once when the, the laser, dra laser printer got disrupted by an inkjet printer. And they set up the inkjet up separately in v Vancouver and had their own sales force, and, and they did very well. But both of those companies are in deep trouble now because they haven't continued to follow that of launching disruptive innovations and keeping it separate. So we've had three types of innovations. Potential innovations, which we understand by understanding the job to be done. Sustaining innovations make good products better. Efficiency innovations helps us produce more with less. The role that they have in growth is that they keep us competitive, um, but they reduce jobs. But they do free, create free cash flow. And so Walmart is an efficiency innovation. The Toyota production system is an efficiency innovation. And again, they're important because if we're not getting more efficient, we get killed sooner rather than we would otherwise get sooner, get killed sooner rather than later. Um, so this is a view of where growth comes from. So the first step is we've got to understand the job and develop a product that does the job well. And essentially what that does is it puts us in the center of the market. And then disruptive innovations make products better and accessible. 
So they create growth. Sustaining innovations make good products better, and efficiency innovations allow us to make uh, more with less. And uh, that's a manager's view of where, um, where growth comes from. Now, why are we not able to keep the growth? And I put the, the problem at the feet of finance people who are taught finance at places like Harvard. So there are two um, elements that are quite important. One is a doctrine uh, that they teach in finance that we call abundance and scarcity. And what that means is, if I've taken a product or a, a order from you, in order to deliver what I tell you I will offer, I have to array the inputs required. And some of the inputs will be costly and scarce, like platinum. And you've got to be really careful about how you use platinum. And others are abundant and cheap, like sand. And I can waste sand. Uh, so we have to take care of what's costly, and we can waste what's abundant. And, uh, and you'll see in finance, historically, we needed to carefully husband the use of capital because capital was costly and scarce. But now it's abundant and cheap, and the world has really changed on us. The second element that finance brought to us is they decided that we should measure our success using ratios rather than whole numbers. Now, when I studied uh, finance in the 1970s, we were, we were taught whole, taught whole uh, finance by whole numbers, like millions of dollars or tons of cash. But <laughs> starting in the mid-1980s, uh, shortly after um, Dan Brick, Mick Dricklin uh, developed the spreadsheet, the analysts who grabbed a hold of the, milk, of, of the spreadsheet started to be bothered that as analysts they wanted to be able to compare uh, Cisco with Sun Microsystems. And they're different companies. And so if I compare them with whole numbers, I couldn't make much sense. But what they realized is if they measured success by ratios, um, then you could compare two companies that are not comparable. So if they want to compare you with Microsoft in whole numbers, it makes no sense. But in fractions, then it commoditizes everything around a denominator. So fractions, I got back to my fifth grade math, uh, a ratio is a fraction. It has a numerator and a denominator. And so if I want to grow, um, I, if I want to, there, there are metrics that we used, and one is return on net assets, or RONA. Um, and another one is internal rate of return, IRR. And these are fractions. So if I'm a manager and I want to get RONA up, sure, I could be more profitable by being more innovative and put the profit on the numerator of the ratio. But holy cow, if that's hard, the denominator is, uh, is, uh, is assets. And I just has to have to outsource everything to get assets off of the denominator. But either way, improving the ratio, numerator or decreasing the denominator, RONA goes up. And it turns out that it is easier to outsource than it is to make more profit. And so in the pursuit of RONA, we just outsource more and more and more. And then internal rate of return is a ratio. The numerator is profit. The denominator is how quickly do I get my money out after I took, put my money in. And either way, uh, internal rate of return improves by doing 
the numerator or the denominator. And because profit is harder to achieve than to only invest in things that pay off in the short term, more and more companies are investing only in short-term payoff projects because that's the way they get into IRR up. And so what's happening to us as a, as a, a nation, and I think you guys temporarily are doing a good job, is um, we're losing our growth because of what finance taught us to do. So <clears throat> just imagine that I'm um, making a really good job at efficiency innovations and that uh, creates free cash flow. And we have so much cash that we have to ask analysts to tell us where we should put our money. So the analysts will look at that disruptive uh, history and they say, you know, we ought to use our money to create disruptive companies. But the problem is, if we invest in disruptive companies, they pay off in five to 10 years, and so internal rate of return will tank. And if, and if we start to create disruptive companies, we'll have to put assets back onto their balance sheet. On the other hand, if we use our money to do another round of efficiency innovations, they pay off in six months to three years. There's no risk. The market is there. It creates free cash flow. So if you wouldn't mind just this once, what I'd like to do is use our money to do another round of efficiency innovations. And I do that, and the problem is we have more free cash flow. And we've got to figure out what do we do with all of this stuff? So can we act the, look at the analyst and say, just take another deeper look at disruptive innovations. And so he does. And he said, the problems are just the same. If we, pay, if we invest to create disruptive products, they pay off in five to 10 years. And Rona's uh, IRR is going to go down. And Rona goes down because it needs assets. So if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just use our money just one more time to do a, another round of efficiency innovations. And the problem is it creates more capital. What, what are we going to do with all this capital? Oh my gosh. And so I'll just do it again and again and again. And, uh, and that's what's happened in our economies in Japan and Europe and increasingly in North America is because we have chosen to measure success with these ratios. Um, our, uh, our analysts grab that free cash flow and use it to create more free cash flow. And if you want to know what's going to happen to America, just look at Japan. Because in the 1950s, or I'm sorry, 60s, 70s, and most of the 80s, Japan's economy was growing at unprecedented rates. And the reason why they were growing was because they had companies in that economy that kept investing in disruptive innovations. So Toyota made cars affordable for mankind. Honda made motorcycles affordable for mankind. Sony made a smart, the, a, a 10 transistor uh, pocket radio that allowed teenagers to listen to rock and roll. And the reason why you guys have printers in your offices and your homes is that Canon disrupted Xerox. But because they made things affordable and accessible, billions of people around the world were able to own and use things that historically had been beyond their reach. And that forced these companies to make more products. And that meant that they had to hire more people to make them and distribute them and sell them and service them. And for 30 years, they had no economic recessions. They had no unemployment because they were going after people who were competing against non-consumption. And in the late 1980s, the analysts in Japan started to measure their success 
as gross margins and net, net present values and internal rates of return. And since 1990, in Japan, they have not yet generated a single new disruptive innovation. And their economy just went, has been flatlined for 25 years. And they have capital everywhere. And the cost of capital is nearly zero, and yet they can't grow because of the metrics that they have chosen. And that's what I worry a lot for uh, the United States, is that uh, increasingly the, fan the, the financial analysts are causing us to use our capital to create capital. And the cost of capital is nearly zero, and yet most companies aren't organized to invest to grow. And uh, you guys are doing a good job, temporarily. Um, anyway, those are just a few of the thoughts that we have about where growth comes from and how to, how to deal with it. So for a company like Google, what metrics would you suggest to break out of this vicious cycle? Well, there is no metric that any analyst uh, has developed or is, mo is motivated to develop. You know, so there are analysts like um, Moody's and, and S&P. Any, an, uh, any uh, indicator that they have is very short term. They have race, their are metrics about this year and next year, but that's it. And we don't have a metric that will allow an analyst to say, for this company, 10 years from now, they are going to be in great shape because they've, these are the products that, that they have in the pipeline. And so you guys have to develop your own. Uh, it turns out that God didn't tell us to use those metrics. Somebody decided to t use those metrics, but it wasn't God who told us. And so we ought to then say to those who, whoever it was that told us the metrics, screw you guys. <laughs> Here's the metric by which we want to be analyzed. Anyway, it's a great question. Yes. All right. Uh, so you opened talking about how the, the, the labor force takes a long time to come back, and it's because people are investing in the things that give you more capital efficiencies. And one of the ones that I think is the bigger investment that you see here at Google is artificial intelligence. So if you look at humanity yeah. as a job to be done, right, before the Industrial Revolution, you had to get things built or made, and human muscles were a good way to do that. And this decade we're looking at you know the job to be done is people need to to think about things and solve problems and human brains are pretty good at that but now ai yeah. is coming it's cheaper it's more scalable what are going to be the jobs that humans can do after this ai revolution yeah that's a great question so these are just a couple of things that i worry about in that initiative okay so we might think um by, by analogy, um, a driverless car um, is a technology is a complicated problem. If we are targeting the, uh, the California freeway as the ap application for a wire wireless, a driverless car, that is a very complicated uh, application. And there are all kinds of legal issues that are just, you know, and the technology needs to be pretty sophisticated. And maybe that'll happen, maybe it won't. But we don't, we've, we don't think about the, if we change this, what are all of the other things that need to change in order to enable ours, this technology be to develop? And so our theory says that where you ought to look is on a farm. And John Deere has wireless tractors going up and down. And the application is very simple. And almost always, uh, when you try to make it affordable and accessible, you start with very simple applications. And then little by little, do that on, but competing with non-consumption is really critical. And so AI, 
what I worry about is although we think that it will make us be able to uh, be better thinkers at lower cost, I worry that the applications of these are actually quite complicated and that we don't think about what are all of the other things that have to occur in order to, for all P, our peace to make it. And, and so it, it could be a big thing, but I bet that in the process we'll realize that we should go after simple applications. And that typically forces us to hire more people. But it's, it's a good one, because whether you call it an efficiency innovation or a disruptive innovation makes a big difference as to, as to the outcome. Thanks. I just want to say thanks for coming. Uh, reading your book is actually one of the reasons I did my MBA and ended up here. So it had a pretty oh, tangible effect on my life. But oh, um, kind. so I wanted to, I want to see if you could help clarify the way that we talk about disruption in regard to the technology itself. Yes. And we have a couple of technologies at Google that could be considered that we that are often called disruptive technologies. Um, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, which is in v very much being built internally to the organization. It's helping improve what we do as a company and can uh -huh. be seen as a sustaining innovation. Um, and then we have, you know, autonomous cars, which are sort of being treated, you know, built at X, external, much more in line with the disruptive mm -hmm. model. So is it the technology that's a disruption or is it the application of the technology? Is it the market effect that makes it disruptive? That's what great, is, what that's is a, a disruptive technology? Yeah, that's a great question. It's actually really important um, for you to say what you just said. Because in many ways, I made a mistake calling the phenomena disruptive, disruptive, because there's so many connotations of the word disruptive in the English language. And so there are a lot of people who call anything that is a dramatic improvement or a, a, a breakthrough we call it disruptive, and that's not true. So almost always, disruption is built within the business model of the technology, of, of the enterprise, not by developing the best technology. So typically, you can take a technology and deploy it onto the California freeway or on a, for, a corn field in Iowa. And how you deploy it determines its disruptiveness. And that's really an important one to do. And people say that I'm a Jewish mother of business in that I'm always worried about everything. Uh, but I worry about you guys, you know, because I think that you are very good at developing potentially disruptive innovations. But I don't think you're, you worry nearly enough about the business models that you have to build that would then take your technology into an application that competes against non-consumption. And I think that's a very important concept, and I don't think I'm totally wrong about that. I also want to start by praising your book. I think it's the best book I've ever read, and it's hard to think of something else has oh, wow. like impacted how I think as much. You're but kind of, you, you've low, you have low standards. But. <laughs> you think so? Well, here comes the but. So I've been wondering this for a little while, but how do you explain certain products that have transformed industries and upended incumbents but don't fit into the framework of low-end disruption? So like, off the top of my head, Uber, iPhone, Tesla all started from the very, very highest end of the market and trickled downwards from yeah. there. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's take them from uh, one at a time, because those are all really good examples. Um, so the theory would say that uh, Tesla is a sustaining innovation, right? So they come in at the high end of the market, and uh, they're deploying it in a very demanding application, which is the California freeway. And what the theory says is that they might be able to develop the product that is the best in the world. But if they go after the best customers of the leaders up there, these guys are going to harness whatever they can, and they will do their best to knock them out, or they will acquire them. So they, in, in a lot of ways, you could think of disruption as 
a theory of competitive response. If I do this, what will the competitors do? And when Toyota came in with the simple product, the theory predicts that, that, that Detroit will just ignore them. And so what's happened is, yes, Tesla is the best with the best product, but Porsche has spent a billion dollars, and they have a completely uh, oh, electric car now. And you can just smell BMW all around them. And so the theory might be wrong, but the theory would say that these other guys are either going to kill Tesla or acquire them. And that's what it would be. But it won't, just like a, 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 a $100,000 Porsche has not transformed the world, a price a, a electric car at that price point actually won't. And uh, that's what the theory says. And Christine and I were in Beijing uh, four weeks ago, walking down the road, and here is this electric car that was as wise as me. And if I had a passenger, I had to fold her up and put it in the, <laughs> the b b boot, you know. And it cost $2,500. And uh, that's where I think the transforming technology will come from. Um, Apple, um, there are a couple of answers to that. But what allowed them to survive when they came in at the high end of the electric mark from the the uh, wireless phone market is they came in to disrupt the, the, the laptop. And they have disrupted the laptop, and that's why they have succeeded. If they had stayed and simply tried to compete against BlackBerry, um, they had a, the benefit for a while of the BlackBerry had an architecture that was excruciatingly interdependent. And so you couldn't develop apps for it. And then Apple came up with, internally, it's interdependent, but there was a standard port, so apps could be developed. And that, that blew BlackBerry out of the water. But then this, um, the Android operating system and Huawei and Samsung are just killing Apple, you know, because they are, they're being disrupted in a conventional way. So on average, I think we can understand why it's happening. Um, but sometimes it takes a few years rather than a few months. Yeah. The incumbent's not going to acquire Uber. That's right. And it taught me a lot about the theory with Uber, you know. So it is true. Well, first they came up and they disrupted the black sedans, you know. And that's unambiguous. But then they came down and they're making a better product than the taxis at roughly the same price. And they've, they've blown them out of the water. They didn't come in at the bottom. And what we realized is that there is a correlation between their coming at the bottom of the market and being successful as disruptors. But the reason why that's causal and not correlative is not, is, is not, it's correlative, not causal, is you look at the business model of Uber. And the taxi is very asset intensive. They own the car and the uh, medallion, and their costs are fixed cost intensive. And they just had to have these, these taxis on the road 24-7 in order to make money. And the Uber business model is they, they have no assets, and their costs are all variable, not fixed. And the taxis actually just can't get there from here. 
you know. And so in, in our thinking, we've decided that we don't want to say they always start at the low end, but they have to develop a business model where the incumbents just can't get there from here. And that's what makes it disruptive. So I learned a lot from that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. I'm going to read one from the Dory. What, what did you notice in your own life or the world around you that inspired you to write, how will you measure your life? And how can companies and institutions help their employees approach measuring their lives in a better way? Wow. Thank you for your question. Can I, can I, we're hitting at three o'clock, so can I answer this one? And for you guys, can we just talk to you afterwards with your, I'm sorry to do yeah, that to you. Okay. So um, why we wrote this book about how you measure your life is just I described here how the metrics that they were using caused them to spend their time and energy in developing uh, they, they did not intend to do what they actually did. And what I realized is just like, and, and why they invested in things that caused them to fail, wasn't that they were stupid, but the resource allocation process, the metrics caused them to send the, put their money in a direction that they did not intend to pursue. So anyway, um, where I work at the Harvard Business School, the, um, the core competence of the Harvard Business School is we are really good at soaking our alumni for donations. <laughs> and so every five years, we invite all of our alumni to come back, and we remember them to please bring their wallets. Um, and we're really good at this. Um, so because Christine and I have lived in Boston so ever since I graduated, we've gone to all of these 5, 10, 15 re year reunions. And I remember when we came back uh, for our fifth reunion, oh my gosh, most of my friends had married people who were much better looking than my friends were. <laughs> they had kids that were well behaved and their jobs were going well. and. Just everything that we imagined would be true was, was unfolding as we thought. But then I noticed for the 10th reunion, gosh, a lot of people who I was looking forward to seeing didn't show up. And when I asked common friends, where is so-and-so, more often than I ever imagined, the answer was that he's in the middle of an awful divorce. And he just doesn't want to talk about it. And uh, for the 15th reunion, there were even fewer people. And when I'd ask about them, more often it was not as he's in an awful divorce or their spouse remarried and now they're raising their children on the other side of the country. And they just don't want to talk to anybody about why life had turned out the wrong way, you know. And then by the 20th and the 25th reunions, it was really scary. And, and it was the same problem. I can tell you with perfect certainty that not a single one of my classmates when we graduated from Harvard planned to go out and raise children who hate their guts and get divorced one or two or three times. Our intention was to create homes where there was happiness there and was a source of happiness for the rest of our lives. But that was what we intend to do, and how we spent our time and energy was just the opposite of that. And the reason why is the very same thing, is the metrics. So those of us who are driven to achievement, that includes at least 100% of us, <laughs> when we have that need for achievement, then when we have an extra 30 minutes of time or ounce of energy, we instinctively spend our time and energy on whatever activities will give us the most immediate and tangible evidence of achievement. And our careers provide that. So um, 
every day at work, I ship a product, I finish a project, I get promoted, I get paid, we close another deal, and every day I get immediate and tangible evidence of achievement at work. And then when I walk into the front door, there's not a lot of evidence of achievement when you look at your kids. On a day-to-day -day basis, they misbehave every day. The place gets uh, cluttered every day. And it really is not until 20 years down the road when you're able to look your kids and put your hands on your hips and say, my gosh, we created a wonderful young man or woman. But on a day-to-day -day basis, there's no evidence of that. And uh, as a result of that, we in invest our time and energy in our careers and underinvest in our children and our spouses, even though we plan to have that be the source of energy. And so that's why I decided I would write that book, How We Measure Your Life. Anyway.